I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and even thrive the crisis that we have really only begun walking through. Today is on Q&A and the questions were all turned over, so I haven't seen them. I'm not really sure why that matters, but okay. So I'm just going to get right into it. And Luann M. asks, is the closing of non-essential mom and pop stores consider, considered shock deflation? If so, how long could it stall hyperinflation? Well, it, it, the whole part of shutting down the global economy or I'm going to talk about that uh, probably tomorrow, 96% of the global economy is definitely shock deflation, as is markets imploding, etc. So yes, this is all shock deflation. But here's the thing about that. It was already starting before coronavirus became a pandemic. So now they're blaming everything on the coronavirus, but quite frankly, this was all starting well before that. If so, how long could it stall hyperinflation? When people start to leave their homes and spend money again, that's when we will most likely see the hyperinflation. Now, I don't have this graph with me because had I read the question, I would have been a little more prepared for this, but I did pull it this morning to show you um, tomorrow, or yeah, probably tomorrow, on the money supply, the M2. So if anybody wants to look at it before I pull it up, just go into the Google Federal Reserve Fred M2 money supply, and you'll see that the money supply is going straight up. Now, right now, people aren't really spending money. And of course, there's been a lot of job losses, so we don't really know how that's going to ultimately impact on the shorter term. But at some point, all of this money printing will come home to roost. I can't tell you exactly how long that's going to be, but well, I'll take a look, and, I'm, and I looked at it today, so I'm watching it religiously to um, see when money starts changing hands more frequently again. So the monetary velocity of the M2 money supply. And that, that's not the broadest base of, of money supply, but that'll give you a really good indication of how much more money is going into the economy. Um, they do the velocity quarterly, so this is just through 19, so that kind of made it worthless to us at this point. But I would imagine it's still going down because they're still working on supporting the stock markets. So stay tuned on that one. When we see that turn up and that turn up in the monetary velocity happens in a pervasive way, then my bet is that's the start of hyperinflation. So we'll have a heads up, and I personally will believe the data. And Ray asks, what kinds of things are we talking about buying with gold when the reset causes gold to go up in terms of fiat? Commodities, stocks, commercial real estate, rental real estate? And I would say the answer is yes to all of that. Also, probably some air rights, mineral rights, those kinds of things. In the strategy, it really depends on what you have to work with. So for example, I have a wonderful client. I mean, I haven't spoken to her in a while because I don't really talk to clients anymore. I don't have time. But she was always wanting to do real estate. But the problem for her was is she didn't have the um, ability or the available talent to manage that. So she needs more passive income, which might be generated from those stocks that manage to survive this. So the answer on all of that is yes, but I'm going to say that it really depends on what your personal circumstance is and the tools that you would have at hand to actually execute your strategy. That's where, you know, talking to our consultants, 
about your personal goals and circumstances makes all the sense in the world because we personally want to set you up for success. We don't want to set you up for failure. So that's a phone call and it does utilize the gold and the silver, which is still available, um, but you don't get to pick and choose and you don't get to, you're going to have delayed delivery, but you're still going to get it. And that'll help you hold your dry powder to convert into commodities or stocks or commercial real estate or residential real estate or rights, all of those things when the time is right for you. And Evan W. asks, in my opinion, will we see inflation or deflation first? Deflation. Absolutely. And there's only one way to fight deflation, which is what we've been seeing with the imploding stock markets. We haven't seen this yet quite in real estate, but be prepared. We're going to be talking about uh, real estate. That's what my deep dive is in this week on Thursday, because tomorrow we have uh, Egon von Greyer, so I'm very excited about that. And I believe we're also going to do that one live. And uh, Daryl B says, I ask, I've always heard that I should hold some cash outside of the banks in case of a crisis. Should I convert most or all of that into gold or silver? Should I still hold some of it for an emergency? Your cash is the very first line of defense. So there is always, again, it goes back to your personal circumstance. There, there is a level of cash that you're going to want to still hold outside of the bank. So, you know, I don't know your personal circumstance, so I can't tell you, well, do I convert all of that into gold and silver? If you don't have any gold and silver, well, that's your second and third line of defense. Your silver is your barterable, so day-to-day -day position, and your gold really holds your wealth to take advantage of those other asset classes, commodity stock, commercial real estate, uh, residential rental real estate, and, um, and uh, rights for after that. So again, I'm going to defer back to the strategy, which I, I created it, just based upon repeatable patterns, because I can't guarantee what's gonna to happen tomorrow. But if something has happened the same way every time and we're doing the same thing, frankly, I think our best shot is we're gonna get, history's gonna repeat itself. It, it always does. It may look a little different on the outside, and that's part of what's really kind of interesting about this awful pandemic, is that the end result of it is the same that I've seen and I've studied in every single financial system reset. We already know that the system, they were out of tools, right? We already knew that coming up next uh, year in 2021, LIBOR was going away. And thanks to Jacqueline, by the way, when I was explaining it to her, I'll put this together really quickly. I think I have a good way to show you what that is and why that, or basically why that's so significant. But that was already going to crash the system. So the fact that this happened in 2020, and I, and frankly, I listened to a really interesting piece on from Dr. Ron Paul on his Liberty Report, and we'll we'll put that link um, in the blog so you can go and look at it. But look at how much of our civil liberties and our freedoms that we're giving up so easily. And you know, I can't point fingers because I've been housebound for what three weeks, going on four weeks now. So I'm quite concerned about it myself. But the reality is, is if we can't get together and talk about it, it's divide and conquer, and we are, are giving up our civil liberties. I'm going to see if we can invite uh, Dr. Paul to come back on and talk about that because it's an extremely important topic. And we have to really figure out what we can do as a community. So all of you viewers there, plus you know all of the other people that do the same kind of work that I do and all of those communities, we have to come together in an open kind of forum, even if we're not face-to-face. -face. So we're gonna work on that. We'll talk more about that later. And uh, so 
so Daryl, you know, give us a call. Talk to, if you haven't spoken to anybody with us, then they'll put you with somebody good. Talk to them about your circumstance and figure out what's right for you. And Doug B says, asks, if all the FDIC insured banks were to fail simultaneously, what percentage could the FDIC cover? Well, at the most current uh, piece that I looked at, they have three cents to insure every dollar. So there's your answer. If all of them were to fail simultaneously or even very close together, in 2008, according to a report from the FDIC, not my opinion, if one more small bank had failed, it would be obvious that they were absolutely insolvent. So they don't even have to all fail simultaneously, just near each other. And in this ample liquidity regime, which means that they are just printing and printing and printing and printing and, oh, let's see, printing some more, uh, rather than the banks. I mean, frankly, there was a run on the banks. That's why you see the money supply going up like that. Bear with me. I'm going to talk more about that this week because I pulled it up this morning and I went, yikes. So I'm going to talk more about that. But the FDIC, you know, they, they don't have, it's a scheme. They even say that it's a scheme. Those are not my words. Those are their words. It's just to make you feel comfortable leaving your money in the bank so that the banks can leverage your equity because it's not really yours. You deposit it in there, they sweep it into sub accounts, and then they get to do anything they want with that money. Um, before I go to the live questions though, I wanted to show you this in the Wall Street Journal and we'll, we'll get the link to that. This came out this morning. You might recall that I have said over and over that during these transitions, food becomes the biggest issue for most people. Now, I'm sure that you've all been experiencing your own level of food going into the grocery stores, finding the shelves bare. But in this particular article on section, it's on page B, one second. This is jump in egg prices pressures grocers. And this is the change in pricing from the beginning of January, egg prices have dropped 229%. 229% because people went to buy eggs. I have chickens and since I'm doing vegan, I'm not even eating those beautiful eggs, but I am supplying them to Megan and to, <laughs> and to Jacqueline and to my sister and to friends and to anybody that, that I ask, what do you need? and I can give them eggs, I can give them salad, which reminds me, we told, uh, we told Jackie we would bring a bag of salad by. We went for a walk this morning uh, and met a neighbor, said, what do you need? And she goes, do you have lettuce? And I said, yes, I do. So we're gonna bring her a bag uh, tonight. Well, I will when I take Daisy for a walk again. Ground beef though is up 47%. Interestingly enough, cheddar cheese, butter, chicken, and ham, and ham particularly was down 42%. The wholesale cost for whole chickens, butter, cheese, and ham have fallen despite consumers rushing to stock up, partly because of plunging demand from restaurants. You know, I thought about this the other day. What if people don't know how to cook? I mean, that's a skill that I learned as a child and that I taught my children, but so many people are really dependent on takeout and restaurants for their food, are they still ordering in or what are what is everybody doing? If you have a personal story to share, please share it. The coronavirus pandemic forces Americans to shift from restaurant dining to eating at home. Soaring prices are frustrating some grocery chain executives who are scrambling to secure supplies and girding for prices to rise even higher while trying to hold prices stable for consumers. But it's that girding for prices to rise even higher. 
let this be a warning for you. We will get to a point in here where we're going to be able to roam free again. Well, I, I hope we'll be able to roam free again. Use that as your opportunity to become as self-sufficient as you possibly can. Because I think that what we're experiencing right now, this is the first bump. But in that hyperinflationary event, because the global central bankers are just going to print us into it, period. And, and you should be able to see that really well. So, you know, keep this in mind and do something about it while we have the opportunity. And Quadman72 asks, if the money printing is kept out of the masses, will this delay hyperinflation? Um, it would delay it, but I think we're going to see universal income uh, come about because what you think when this is over, boom, they're going to flip a switch and everything and people are going to go back to work. There's so many small mom and pops that will be shuttered that will not come back on. And the mom and pop shops employ about 48% of the general population. Plus they do even more than that in hiring. So we don't know what this is going to look like. Just like the stock market has been up, what, almost, what, 9% yesterday. And when I looked before we came in here, about 7% today. Do you have any idea what the value of any of those companies are? Heck no. But what you know is the government is printing us into oblivion. And that money is designed to go into the stock market and fight that deflation. And uh, J.K. Co. asks, What's the difference between physical gold and collector's gold? Well, collector's gold is physical, but it has a different designation according to the IRS. So for me, in like with my Uncle Al, who just had pre-33 coins and had at least 3,000 of them when you couldn't own more than five, for me, it's the most likely ability to hold on to your gold and be able to use it in the normal marketplace as opportunities arise. That's what it is for me. And even though the premiums have gone up a bit, they're still severely undervalued. And it's what you can really get your hands on. When people finally realize out there that, hey, they really need to have some gold, Imagine what those premiums are going to, to do. Now, will you sell in to convert it into the fiat? Not if you listen to my channel and you believe all the hard data, except when it's time to pay off a mortgage or perhaps convert it, etc. So just stay tuned, but that's the difference between the two. Uh, physical gold, if it's new gold, they're both physical, but if it's new gold, that's bullion. That is the most likely. If they do an over confiscation, that is what they will most likely confiscate because it's, you know, roughly 98% of all the gold that's out there. Much better. And they control the spot price. So that one's easy peasy. And uh, Aladad Gabhar says, asks, if they do reset on the money, will my money in the bank be taken away? Well, your money, whatever money you have in the bank will be reset accordingly. Now, I don't know what level of the initial reset that it's going to be, but when you look at historic resets, a thousand to one comes up a lot. So if you have a thousand dollars in the bank, the next morning you wake up, there's one there and that's it. And yeah, whatever is in the bank, but of course, keep in mind that even your cash in the wild, so in other words, money, uh, cash that you take out of the banking system, will also reset. Um, and let's see, oh, why make gold a tier one asset? Well, uh, what they're referring to, what Tony is referring to, is uh, the banks that hold reserves. And tier one is the safest level, most liquid level of asset. And the reason why gold is tier one and why they made it that way, quite honestly, they knew in 2008 that the system died. They knew it. They knew it. They knew it. They knew it. 
And whoever holds gold is going to hold their purchasing power and their wealth and therefore be in a much better position as we go through this. Because I want you to keep in mind that wealth never disappears. It merely shifts location. What are reserves? Reserves are like a savings account. If there's a little glitch in your, in your checking account or what have you, and you have savings, you can move that money in and it's not really that big a deal for you. If you have a little glitch in your savings account and, or your checking account and you don't have any savings to cover it, it's probably a much bigger problem. So the same thing would be true for the banks and that's why gold is a tier one asset. And um, we, I have a, an interview that's coming up, but Axiom Curb Community asks, our question for Lynette is what strategy would best be put in place for those solely dealing with decentralized crypto assets and who has no gold or silver or cash to start physically investing now? Well, I would take some of those decentralized crypto assets and I would frankly treat them exactly the same way that I would treat any stock holdings or bond holdings or 401k holdings or any of that. You still need a certain level of gold and it's all in the strategy and it's all under a formula. So if you call us, we'll be able to help you with that tell you how much gold you need to protect what you're holding in crypto. If all you're holding in crypto, I mean, the grid can go down, it can disappear. I mean, we've seen it. I mean, what can I say? I don't personally own any crypto. I'm not saying that I never will, but they're developing that market. It is not yet a developed market and it is absolutely an intangible. And how's that working for you now? right? At least with my physical gold and silver, if I needed to convert it, I could do so in a heartbeat and there's huge demand. And one more question and then I'm sorry, but I have to go for today. Uh, Robert Majorski asks, will silver drop more in price if the feds print and stimulates the game all over again? The printing press won't stop. Correct. The printing press is not going to stop. They're ramping it up. They had such huge demand for small businesses borrowing that they are working on expanding that program. We'll know more about that on Thursday. But will silver prices, uh, silver drop more in price if the Fred, Fed prints and stimulates the game all over again? The answer is, is that the Federal Reserve and the banks control the paper price of both gold and both silver. So you cannot look at those just like the stock market. There is no good price discovery on silver or gold or stocks or bonds, you know, or anything. There's no, even real estate, there's no good price discovery on anything. But look at the premiums that you're having to pay on silver. With spots somewhere around 14, 15 bucks an ounce, you're lucky to get an ounce of silver for 20, 24 bucks uh, an ounce. And guess what? I personally don't even have access to that anymore because all of the silver and gold that ITM has access to goes to clients first, as it should be, as it should be. So I can't even buy it and I'd pay a bigger premium for it because I know what the true value, the fundamental value of gold and silver is. And it's, it's in terms of dollars or rubles or euros or yen or any of those fiat monies. It is substantially higher from here because both silver and gold have complete global demand across every single avenue of the global economy. It's not money because the government says that it's money and therefore they can suddenly say, meh, not money anymore. It's why they hate it so much. It's why they don't want you to hold it. It's because it's outside of the system, runs no counterparty risk, and hey, it's full demand. So hey, sometimes that'll go up and down. I mean, silver is also an industrial metal, which is one of the reasons why you've seen that drop a lot more than gold is because of the global economy. 
but the economy was downturning before the coronavirus. So, you know, is this just to justify, oh, look, it's the viruses, not what I did. No, it's what those central bankers did, and they should not be allowed to stay in power. And if enough of us, if enough of us come together, maybe they won't, and maybe we'll be able to have a more just and fair monetary system. So I am told that all gold and silver is not sold out. You still have time to call us, but I'm telling you right now, you got to get on the list and you cannot pick and choose. Those days gone. I don't know that we will ever see those days again. But if you have wealth that you need to protect, protect it. Physical gold and silver in your possession is the best way to do that. And uh, right after this, I am going to be meeting with my very dear friend Rice Crypto on his channel. And then tomorrow early, it's, it's 8 Mountain Standard Time. Again, I'm going to do a coffee with Lynette with Egon Von Greyers. And maybe he's in London, maybe he's in Switzerland. We're going to get... He's in Switzerland. Okay, so, oh, that'll be great. We're going to get a much different perspective on what's happening in the gold and silver markets, particularly the gold markets, um, from him. I'm very excited. And next week, I have another coffee with Lynette with Liar Gans. And I don't know where he is in the world either. So he could be in Israel. He could be in England. I think, was he in Israel the last time? So he's probably still in Israel. And I think it's really important to get that boots on the ground perspective because we all need to see everybody's perspective on it. Whether you agree, whether you disagree, it doesn't matter. But you need a lot of information coming in so that you can make educated choices that make sense to you first. That's what we have to do. You have to look at what's in your best interest first, period, end of discussion. And then come together as a community so that we can all do that. If you have any questions about this or anything else, send them to questions at itmtrading.com. Make sure you visit our blog. Um, we have, I don't know whether we're putting it below or on the blog, but that's typically where we put the links and the images and all of that. So uh, this will also be loaded up to brighteon.com. And if you're concerned about any of this and you want to look at developing a strategy, or if you've already developed the strategy, you want to see where you're at with the strategy, give us a call. We love human contact. 888-696-4653. And please, please, please be safe out there. And remember... Financial shields are made of physical gold and silver, and it is definitely time to CYA, cover your assets. Until tomorrow, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.